I just completely and utterly botched the first version of this film, which if you know me and my technology woes, you will know is pretty much par for the course. So what's different about today? I am using an Atomos Ninja recorder, which is right below my X-T4, because if I use the flip out screen on the X-T4, it could be literally across the room and I would stare at it the entire time. So now I have an Ad Atomos Ninja, this might be the first film of the year. I honestly don't remember. It's January 6th. The government is under siege. I think they just evacuated the Senate. So we got that going on. That looks really good. <clears throat> As you can see, I'm choking up. This film is for professional photographers. The rest of you might gain something from this as well, hopefully, and if not, and I rarely would I make a film for professional photographers, but I think this one makes sense because I made so many mistakes in my life as a photographer, dating all the way back to my education, and if you can avoid my mistake by listening to me do some stupid things, then I think it's beneficial for everyone. So, I made some trusty notes on my iPad Pro, which is one of the few pieces of tech that is not broken in my hands. Also, the recorder is not showing me where the focus is, but it looks like I'm in focus, and that's enough for me. Okay, so I have a traditional photographic education. I got a degree in photojournalism from what I would call a classic program. And during that program, they gave us an idea of what a photography book was supposed to be. It was supposed to be the largest coffee table book you could possibly get. It had super high-end uh, materials. You had to work on it forever. It had to have a foreword written by someone very, very serious in the academic world or the journalism world or the literature world. And then when you got the book, it had to be arduous. The whole process just had to be life-changingly hard to get this done. And then once the book arrived, you were supposed to sit around and in, in rooms with fancy furniture and people in smoking jackets and pipes and just consider the profundity of the entire project. That's kind of what the photo book was presented as, as this mid-career monographic monstrosity. And it was kind of dark and gloomy because it was such a mountain to climb to get there. And I, like an idiot, lived under that pretext from 1992 until 2007. And then suddenly in 2007, I make this trivial, inconsequential, down by the river book, and all of a sudden, people respond. It's a $4 book and people are like, wow, that's cool, can I get one? Can I buy one, where can I buy one? And I'm like, no, 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 don't buy this one. It's not a real book, this isn't serious. No one wrote the foreword, there's no intro, there's no outro, there's no front matter, there's no back matter, there's nothing about this book that's right. Don't buy it, you shouldn't even want this book. And people were like, don't care, want it. Are you gonna sell it or not sell it? And I was like, whoa, what did I just do? What did I just waste over the last 15 years? My bad. That moment, everything changed in my publishing life. I also finally came to the realization in about 2006 or seven that print-on-demand technology was new. I could suddenly produce a book in an, in an edition of one. Just make one copy of one book and I could be perfectly happy in that ecosystem because I made a list for everyone. Not every book needs or demands public attention. Not every book needs a fundraising campaign. Not every book needs a publisher. Not every book needs to serve as a judge of your character and talent. And number five is not every book needs to be a revenue source. There is something called fun and entertainment and it gets lost in this monumental amount of pressure we put on ourselves to perform in the publishing space. I have to get a publisher. I have to sell tens of thousands of copies. I have to build a name. I have to get famous. I have to build a following. I have to sell these. I have to go on book tours. I have to be known as the photographer that did X, Y, and Z. And what happens is you get unhappy. I know that because you call me or you email me and you ask me to walk you through what I know about publishing, which I love doing because I love traditional publishing. I live in a town, it's a small town, that has two unbelievable publishers. We also have one of the best illustrated bookstores in the world in PhotoEye, and the books that are in that store and the books that come out of these two publishers here in town, Twin Palms and Radius, they are works of art. I have a great appreciation for them and I have those books on my shelf. Not all of them, but I have books from both publishers on my shelf. They are fantastic. Traditional publishers can do things that a self-publisher cannot and vice versa. Even a lot of people who have the, the greatest intentions to self-publish often aren't prepared. They don't know how to market, they don't know how to distribute, they're not sure what book to make, they're not sure what their audience is, is willing to, to purchase or engage with. It's complicated. And so what I realized in about 2006 or seven was that I could make a single copy of a book. I could just make one and be perfectly happy. 
and I started to tinker, but something strange happened, which I'll talk about in a minute. The first book I made was based on the fact that so many photographers were calling me obsessed about color management. Now, color management is one of the most boring topics I have ever discovered in my life. If we took color management and we put it in a time capsule and we fired it into space, if any alien species found it, they would be so bored out of their mind, they would leave us alone. They would never come here. So these photographers would call obsessed about color. And I'm like, just make sure your color's good, but make an interesting book. It's way more important than your color management. They would never listen. So I did a book called the RGB book, and I made a red book, a green book, and a blue book, and I glued them together. And I just called it the RGB book. What was inside of the red book and the green book and the blue book? Nothing, just that color. There was no copy, no photographs, no nothing. There were just red, green, and blue glued together and I made an RGB book. And I showed it to a friend of mine who's a basically a contemporary art photographer. And he goes, oh, Milner, I love this. You gotta do the CMYK book. So I did the CMYK book. It's just four books glued together. There's nothing in here. It's just cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. I'm not taking myself that seriously. I just did this book and I moved on. I was like, that's kind of funny, I'll move on. Then I did a book called My Brain on the Internet, right? I did these little illustrations. I'll show you one here and I'll do some wizardry with the top down here in a minute, I did these, and what I did is I called American high-level news sites. These are the news sites that are rumored to be the best news gatherers in the world, right? We hold them in such high regard. They're out fighting democracy, you know, in, this, in these pages. But they're all susceptible to clickbait. They're all phonies, right? Because in the, in the midst of the serious stories, the Israel and Iran having a conflict story, were things like the following. Breast implants and kittens, strange things left at hotels. Whew, huge asteroid won't hit Earth until 2036. Adult twins, deaf and going blind, euthanized in Belgium. Five-year-old suspended for toy gun threat. Six reasons why you should sleep naked. Oh, let me get some good ones here. Mexican ape woman buried after 150 years. 90-year-old mom is actually 12 or 13, officials say. Wait, there's even better. There's, there's even better stuff. And I, I added little illustrations in here. This is just a little, not a trivial blurb trade book. Woman's house burned down by snake, she set on fire. Man shoots tree, tree fires back. You get my idea. We pander to the brainless masses with clickbait and that's what this book was about. That's it, I just made one copy and I moved on and added it to the pile. Something strange started to happen. The pile of edition of one books began to grow. I go to a meeting in LA with a friend of mine and I'm showing him the, some of these books and there's someone there who's in the museum space. And this person says, hey, these books are kind of cool. We'd like to maybe talk to you when you're done about getting them in our collection. And I'm like, no, 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 not these books. You don't mean these books, these idiotic experiments that I'm doing. And she said something very funny. She goes, um, these are con conceptual art books. And I go, no, they're not. They're idiotic and they're just experiments. And she goes, I know you're not comfortable with this term, but that's what they are, and that's how I see them, and we would be interested. So I ignored everything she said, and I kept going out and making books. Now, the last one I'm gonna show you is this disgusting disaster. This is a case on top of the book that's inside. This has been shot to pieces with paintball guns because the book I did is called War Games. In War Games, was a tribute to the best movie of 1983 with Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy. And if you're a computer geek, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this was a book called War Games about people who play war during the time the country is at war. I went to a paintball field. I talked to the owners. I said, this is my idea. And oddly enough, they said, that's a really cool idea. So I put on a bright red shirt. I went to the paintball field. I got in the field, two teams, referee in the middle. Referee says to all the paintball players, this guy in the red shirt is a photographer. Under no circumstances do you shoot him. He's here to make pictures. I had my two contacts G2s that were sacrificial lambs because as soon as he blew the whistle, a hundred people turned and shot me. And yes, paintballs hurt. They hurt more than you could possibly imagine. So the guys kind of got it out of their system. They lit me up and then I got on with my project. And I did this book and it's about people who are playing war during the time that we're at war. And at that time we were in two theaters, we're in Iraq and Afghanistan. So when I got the book back, one copy of the book, blurb 1113 with ProLine uncoded, one copy, that's it. I was perfectly happy, but I kind of felt like the project was unfinished. So I went back to the paintball field. I took the book and the case. 
I put it out on the firing line and the guys lit it up with their paintballs. And they turned up that PSI or whatever you call it where your gun is firing way harder than it's supposed to when you're shooting a human and they just blew this book to pieces. Then I took a spray adhesive and I sprayed the whole thing so the paint and the particles would stay on the book and then I put it in this case and I wrapped it up and I promptly forgot about it. And this is just one of probably 20 edition of one books, some of which I think are interesting and some are total trash. But the, the, the cool thing is I learned from all of them. And this is just a really disgusting box at this point. So another last chapter to this is years later, I was approached again by someone from the museum space who saw some of these books and said the same exact thing. Huh, these are interesting. This is a real play on what the power of print on demand actually is, that you can make an individual book. You just have to make one. This is an idea that is completely and utterly lost on the vast majority of photographers I run into because we've all been programmed to think that everything we do is important and everything demands the traditional cycle of what a book is. And that's simply not true. And it's this sort of repressive regime idea of what you have to do when you do a book. And the idea that you can make an individual book is so incredibly powerful. Think about it from a portfolio perspective. Say that you're going to Manhattan to show your work to editors or art buyers or agents or whoever. You can make individual books for an individual person. You can make them before the meeting. You can make them after the meeting. This is something that the edition of One Books taught me was that my specificity with publications was not nearly what it should be. My idea back in the early days when I got out of school was I'm going to make a book and sell it to a bunch of people I don't know. And that's not only very difficult, but it's also detached. Many of the people that are getting the book have no communications with you whatsoever. They may, they may use the book. They may look at it. It may end up on a shelf and no one ever sees it. Yes, you might make a dollar from that book, but who cares? And so there's this other massive world of opportunity with publishing. And it's not just Blurb. It's any company that allows you to print in individual form. Just making one is so much fun and so powerful and strategic. And I just wanted to make this film because I, when I rediscovered this gelatinous, disgusting mass in front of me, I was like, oh, I think there's a lesson in here. I botched it from 1992 to 2007. I wasted when it comes to publishing. And by the way, during that time frame, I was making portfolios that were different from anyone else. I was getting letters from, from clients saying, we've never seen a portfolio like this before. So I was self-publishing. I was experimenting and tinkering back in the early 90s forward, but I still feel like I botched it because I just was still too planted in that idea that my publishing life was in the hands of other people. My photography was in the hands of other people. And in 2007, I was like, uh-uh, I'm taking it back. I'm doing what I want. And again, just to, just to reemphasize, I love me traditional publishers. You, uh, there's 150 books right here, and there's a whole bunch more back here, and there's a whole bunch more in boxes. I love these books, but different things for different people in different projects in different times. Have fun tinker, experiment, making individual books is a blast. And now that I found this again, I think I'm gonna start doing this again. I think I'm gonna start making individual books again, cause it is fun. So I hope that was helpful. It's probably rambling. I don't know if the audio worked. The thing looks like it's cutting in and out. Are my mics on? Is my hair okay? Is it in focus? Someone sent me a tube that's right here. I don't need to share that necessarily, but it's here for some reason. I hope this year is treating you well. Let's hope that 2021 is an upgrade over 2020. Let's stop drawing lines in the sand and let's reach our hands out to people that we may or may not agree with. And let's try to bring things together in the middle of the field. Let's use a football analogy here. Let's huddle up. Let's huddle up as a culture and move on. Creatives, you have a responsibility. You are an integral part of the GDP of this country and other countries around the world. And it's your responsibility to be the most creative person you can because society is depending on you. So let's act like it, let's get together, let's experiment, let's have fun, and best of luck in 2021.